Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. In my last video, I discussed C as being the lingua franca, or Frankish language, of programming languages. Today, I want to dig deeper into that topic. It's also motivated by the D2.091 release that came out in March, which included, among other things, experimental support for C++ header generation from your extern C and C++ declarations. So for example, if you have modules that look like this, D now can generate header files that include these C++ declarations. For my purposes today, I'm interested in C libraries and C APIs, not C++. But still, this helped motivate my thought on this process. And of course, you can export C APIs from a C++ library. And you can do so from Rust as well by making sure to include nomangle and extern C in your function definitions. Although it will not automatically generate a C header file for you. There are third-party solutions such as C bindgen that can create such uh, header files for you for your C APIs. But for today, I'm going to focus on D and also Zig and Nim as languages which include built-in support for generating header files. Here's the basic C program I'm going to be working with. It just calls a function from a library I'm going to be creating that's going to chant some message defined by the library as many times as I tell it to. So for example, if my library creates cheer, then it will go cheer, cheer, cheer if you say chant three times. And then it prints a message and frees it when it's done. And I'm going to start from Zig rather than from D, which I'll explain a little bit more later. Zig has the ability to include C header files and interpret them directly as part of the compilation process. So there's no uh, binding to worry about when you're talking about Zig. In terms of implementation, the text that Zig is going to chant is Zig. And so I'm going to upfront allocate using C's malloc the amount of space I need for the repeated string. Again, the C application is going to expect to free using free from the standard C library. And so I need to make sure to allocate it in a way that free will make sense. That's why I'm using malloc here. And then I just loop across however many times I've been asked for. And I'm going to copy my string into the next location in the result. And I'm going to replace the previous times null care with a space afterward. And then I return whatever I'm done with. When I compile my zig, I'm going to emit a header here. And I'm going to link with the library that I created. So I can call zig, and I get the result as expected. Zig, zig, zig for three times. This is the generated header file. It created this for me automatically. And I've included it from my C program. And we see here that it knows what this is. And so that's our basic idea of what's going on in our example today. The D example is going to be very similar. If I were using the full D language, it would look much more succinct and fairly simple. But this also includes things like garbage collection and so on. And for the purposes of this demo, I decided to go with the better C version of D. This is what they literally call it. It has this op command line option dash better C with the idea that if you wanted to be a C programmer, you're still better off using D instead of C itself. Better C includes most of the full D language features, but does leave out certain important ones, such as garbage collection and dynamic type information. And so because of those kinds of changes, I'm going to be focusing on uh, an implementation that's very similar to what we saw in Zig. I'm going to malloc the space from my output, having imported malloc already. And the string that I'm going to chant is D. And one slight difference from how I implemented it in Zig is that instead of using stir copy, I'm using the built-in feature of D for slice assignment. So I'm going to be assigning to various slices the content of my string that I'm repeating. And I'm going to manually null terminate when I'm done. I build it like this, again with the bet, dash better C option. And I will be generating a header file, but I won't be using it, as we'll see in a second. Sweet. The reason I'm not using the header file is because, as we already read from the documentation, it is generating a C++ header file. And this right here is not going to be parsable from C. And this contrasts with Zig, which is a little more C-focused. And so while it still works for C++, they're trying to be friendly to C language as well. And so because of that, back here in my C application, I'm using the Zig header file in both cases. Now, this uint pointer t versus the uint 64 t that we got for the two different versions won't matter for the single architecture that I'm on at the moment. But it might matter if you want to export these out further. So pay close attention to those kinds of things and what you can get away with depending on your actual circumstances. And moving on from D, I want to show an example in NIM. And I'm going to use standard NIM language features, which means I'm also going to have garbage collection to deal with, which is a pro and a con, really. So here I've got my simple repeat NIM, count times, join with a space. And then I malloc enough space for the entire string, including the null character. 
and I stir copy into the results. I'm using standard C, malloc, and stir copy, which I can define the prototypes for right here inside of my NIM program. And if I look at the build script that I have, when I generate the header file, it generates it over in NIM's cache directory. And so I have to either add that to my include path or copy it into my current directory uh, in order to make use of it. Furthermore, when I compile my C app, I supply a NIM preprocessor symbol so that I can modify how the C gets compiled. If we look over here again, notice we say if def NIM, we're gonna include NIM call instead of zig call. And I also need to initialize the NIM runtime in order to make sure that garbage collection and everything else is ready for NIM's usage. And without this, I'll just get crashing instead. So anytime you have a runtime to initialize, such as for example, with the full D language, make sure you take care of that before you try using the functions that you're calling. But if I call it here, if I call it correctly here, then I'll get NIM, NIM, NIM. And meanwhile, here's the NIM header file that got created for me. Here's my chant declaration, and here's my NIM main declaration that I had to call as well. And interestingly, NIM chooses to reference its own NIM base.h from my generated header file rather than including all the definitions directly into the header file. So you have to make sure that's available on your include path as well. And then meanwhile, of course, we were talking about C as a Frankish language, which means we should be able to go between other languages as well. It doesn't have to be C on either side. So for example here, I made a version of my C application written in Zig, and Zig's gonna call NIM. And just like I said before, I can include the NIM header file directly into my Zig program, and then I can call NIM main automatically namespaced by the include that I put on top of it, call my chant function, free when I'm done, and print the message that I had. And call NIM from Zig, it works as expected. And another fun thing to look at here is gonna be to see how big are these executables that got created. And interestingly, whatever it's doing, D makes tiny executables. And for NIM and Zig in each of these cases, I've asked it to optimize for size. But so even though both of these are larger than D, they're not really that large. And in fact, one of the interesting things about NIM is that it includes a runtime and garbage collection and it still comes in under 80K, which I think is pretty fantastic. Moving on from the static linking that I'm showing here between the languages so far, we can also, through C APIs, generate dynamic libraries and load them up on the fly and use them in other languages as well, such as C again, or from uh, scripting languages such as like Python or Ruby or so on. So let's build these dynamic libraries. And let's look at how big they are for fun. We see about the same thing we saw before, which is that D is substantially smaller, and in each case, they're slightly smaller than the executables were, which I guess makes sense. Then we can call these libraries from Python. Over here we have dynamically loading the different shared objects, and then I can call chant on each of these libraries. Here's what this looks like in Python. I can use the C types module in order to load libraries, including the C standard library. I can define argument types and result types for my functions. And then when I call chant, I'll just call chant, except that I'm gonna convert the result to a Python string. And note that this means that there's gonna be extra allocations going on, even beyond whatever's happening inside of the libraries. So these are issues you have to keep in mind in terms of what are the requirements you have for memory allocation in your own libraries and uses of them. And when I'm done, of course, I wanna free the result that came out from the library so that I don't have memory leaks. And then furthermore, when I'm using NIM, just like I saw before from C, I have to make sure to initialize the NIM runtime. That said though, I can call chant on each of my libraries. And I get DDD, NIM, 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 zig, zig, zig. If I want them to chant harder, I can increase the number of times it goes. And now we're big fans of our languages. Meanwhile, I hope it's been fun, and perhaps we can talk about this more in the future. Bye, y'all.